Hello and welcome to CoinGeek Conversations. Today we're going to be hearing about an ambitious new app that aims to keep us safe from COVID using the BSV blockchain. But first, tokenization and a new product that will allow anyone to issue their own tokens. And we're not talking about ICOs again. This is going to be for much more wholesome uses, like teachers who want to reward pupils in their class. And to discuss both of these, I'm very pleased to welcome Eric Bernhardt from the Bayesian Group, who is in Toronto. Hi, Eric. Hi, nice to meet you. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. You're listening to Coin Geek Conversations with Charles Miller. Okay, so let's start off by diving right into this new product that you have got. Just uh, talk me through what uh, the experience would be like. Supposing I am a teacher and I want to create a new system that will provide rewards for my best pupils. How, how would it work? So the the tokenization product that we're building is, like you said, really meant to make it very easy for anybody to create a token and 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 share that token with whoever they want to. In terms of the the user's experience, it's going to be three to four steps where they name the token they want, uh, they they talk about you know the use of it, and then and then they start by and then the token gets created. It, and they have the ability to start sharing it with other people. Uh, you know, because we've built it on the BSV blockchain, the the transfer fees to send those tokens are very, very low. Okay, so supposing I want to create my own token, I go onto your website and I register. How do I actually get it get the system working in terms of awarding it to people? Yeah, it's super easy. So all once you're into the system, it's just a two clicks to say, uh, this is how many tokens I want to transfer. And then instead of using the long string of characters that are for wallets, we've partnered with a, a service called Paymail. And Paymail is essentially an email layer on top of wallet addresses. And so all people need to do is enter somebody's Paymail email address. And it might be, you know, like Eric at you know, Eric123 at paymail.io. And then it goes to that, and, and Paymail knows that that wallet address is connected to that an individual or or you know an underlying wallet and that and that's all you need to do so you just say i want to transfer 10,000 tokens to paymail address eric123 and uh, and it goes and that's it and then there's there's again there's small transaction fee um, we're even thinking about in the beginning making that fee uh, comp like it's free the, the transfers will be free to start so that's so that there's no there's no barrier for people to try to use it really what we're trying to see is how people will use a service like this that's super simple that has limitless possibilities and we don't want to limit anybody because they're because they're worried about you know having a bsv wallet or buying bsv in the country that they're in so so in the beginning we're going to you know offer free trades before we get into the business model just Talk me through, uh, supposing I'm a pupil and uh, you, you say I need to get my pay mail set up. What, mm -hmm. what would the registration process consist of for the recipient of a token? Yeah, so, so what, we're, what we've done is to make it as simple as possible is that we will automatically create a pay mail wallet for somebody um, when there is a transfer to to an account that doesn't exist and so and so that will be built into the system to say I want to send it to this person you know either you know your PayMail address or you don't know their PayMail address and you just incorporate their regular email address and then we will st start the process with that person to set up a PayMail um, wallet so if I'm a pupil and I tell my teacher that my email is charles at gmail.com mm -hmm. what happens then so so your teacher would go into our system and enter charles at gmail.com we would recognize that that's not a paymail email address and send an email to charles at gmail.com saying hey your teacher wants to send you some tokens they want to send you this many for this purpose um the the way to receive that is by setting up a paymail address 
click here to create a PayMail wallet. And they click there and then it automatically creates them and assigns them an, uh, a, a PayMail address. And then it communicates back with our service and says, this PayMail address has been created for that invitation that you sent. So then when, when, when I've got my PayMail address, then all I need to do is remember what the address is and the password that I've chosen for it. And then I can go to it and see what my balance is. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And it's super simple. I think that, you know, from from the the person that's sending the tokens perspective, they don't have to know any of that information. The only thing that the recipient needs to know is that information, their PayMail address and their login details. And and we will we will support them through that. And so if I'm the issuer of the token, is there some sort of overview of who I've sent tokens to and where they all are and so on. Absolutely, absolutely. There, because everything's on the blockchain, the, we have a trans, the transaction records. So we know when the, tra the tokens have been shared with somebody and we know whether those, whether those are currently in circulation or being held or, or if those tokens go from one, because, because they're transferable to, between students and recipients, um, what can happen is one student gets 5,000 tokens and then they share that share a thousand with their little brother totally feasible and then and then you know and then they're eligible to use those tokens however the the issuer or the teacher in this case sees fit okay so my only worry about that would be if i'm a teacher and i give tokens to the best pupils and then i'm going to provide some kind of reward for the best pupils uh, I'm not going to be very pleased if it turns out that uh, actually the worst pupils now ha are the owners of these tokens. It's all about how the teacher creates the incentives, right? Because if the incentives are strong enough to keep the tokens, then people are not going to share them, right? Right. But if the incentive is not strong enough, then then people are, aren't going to want to trade them, right? So, so, so that's the so, teacher's problem. <laughs> yeah. I think I think this is where and, and we're going to make sure we provide guidance around, you know, markets and, and the way the markets and, and the way that, you know, incentivizes people mm -hmm. when they're trading back and forth. I mean, if you think about this from existing trading things. So so I think the, the best way to think about this from for me is Pokemon cards. Mm -hmm. And and it's a massive industry, and you have people that are holding those Pokemon cards because they know that the value is going to go up. There's different cards that have different values, and and you know the best Pokemon players usually have the best cards because they've spent time acquiring them. And so and so, a part of the process is is that right? And these tokens, they because they have value, there there has the the market will take shape, right? And I think that you know in this example. We can, we can, we don't want to, even though we can, you know, restrict the the ability for people to share those tokens. Like I think that that defeats the purpose of hmm. having a token and and creating a unique marketplace. Well, we, we talked about pupils and teachers, but do you, what, what other kind of situations have you got in mind that this might be useful for? Yeah, so so I think that the one of the interesting ways is is to use tokens without focusing on any inherent um, monetary value. And, and I say monetary in, in the sort of the, the broadest sense where, where you know, the, the incentive is not in the value of the tokens, that, that it's worth something. The incentive is actually in the utility of that token and the data that you get collected, you can collect from it. And so, so one of the things that we've been thinking about quite a bit is COVID and how we can support the global community, uh, research community and hospitals and governments by leveraging blockchain technology. And so what, what, what one of the things that we've been exploring is, well, if we issue a token uh, that's called, you know, COVID token, and then, and then we, we create or issue the supply of every single person in the world then what we can do is people can go and they can update their health status onto these tokens and so all of a sudden this token it doesn't have monetary value because 
right? But it has intrinsic value because of its utility and the data that's stored within it. And so the data is because of blockchain and the protocols that we use, they're they're inherently they're decentralized. They're pseudo anonymous, so that means that nobody can tie back to an individual name. But we know that 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 data is unique to an individual, and and those two the combination of two those two things makes it the perfect mechanism to collect health data. So you know think think about you're sitting at home and you're you're wondering whether or not you should go to the grocery store and and you go check out your this the covid you know token uh dashboard or or heat map and you can zoom into your area and know that the, the 3000 people around you have said i'm feeling okay and and so what 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 we'll do to, is take that and say okay so so the spread of of the virus in your community is is likely a lot lower than if somebody in your community or has has been has isn't feeling great right if they're feeling they have a fever right that fever is within the guidelines for being concerned about it and so what we're trying to do is build a model that is preventative mm -hmm. this is quite similar to what what existing app or apps that are being developed are going to be doing right no it's not it's it's different so all that so there's there's sort of two major apps that have been designed to support people with COVID-19. The first one is contact tracing and contact tracing takes from the point of when somebody has tested positive for the virus, it goes back and set, and uses Google and Apple device you know, information and goes back and says, okay, where did this person come from? What what are the all the devices that this person has interacted right. with? And every, anyone along. who was close to that person will get an alert saying, "Watch out!" So, yeah, something like that, right? But they're really what they're trying to do is figure out where that person got it from, so they can so they can understand what the origin of that, and then trace it back to the origin origin, and and that's and that's what they do for around community spread, and so the other the other piece is also retroactive, saying. I, you know, it is these long surveys that are asking you all sorts of questions like they ask you in medical questionnaires, you know, you're they're they're doing demographic data, they're collecting, you know, your health status, like, have you talked, who have you talked to, and, and it's a very detailed data collection mechanism. And w while that's great, it's the the problem with both of those things is that the data is centralized. So whether the app is owned by the NHS, whether the app is own, whether the contact tracing app is owned by John Hopkins or who, it's still centralized. And so because it's centralized, the data it we don't no one gets access to it except the people that are allowed access. And 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 this is a fundamental issue for privacy for people and ownership of data. And so what we're saying is, okay, one, we're going to decentralize. That means that nobody owns the data. There's no ownership. But does that also Every mean that the, nobody has an overview of what's happening across the country or whatever? No, not at all, because because the data is is published to the blockchain and that data is accessible to the same organizations that use centralized data sources. And so they'll, they'll incorporate this data into their their models and and. And so, the, and just coming back to the, the way that it's different outside of the decentralized model is that it's it's a lot simpler. It's it's very simple. It's it's pseudo anonymous, so people can control their privacy. Just to be clear, then, if if I take part in this, uh, I would be asked basically just, have I got a fever or not? Well, I think and that also then it would know where I am because it would have geolocation on my phone, right? So, so what what we're trying to do is also sort of distribute the the way that people can update their health status, and so it's it's a very simple question like how are you feeling today, and and you know and 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 I think this is a question that we can ask now and know that people are thinking about the virus when they're mm -hmm. answering that question, and so what would happen is you would answer that question and then you would post you could post that or submit that status across almost any medium that you choose 
private or public. So you can you could tweet to say feeling great today and that hashtag COVID token, or you could you could send an email to at COVID token dot com, uh, or you can send a private message or you can put it on Slack. And, and so what we're doing is we're partnering with all these different input mechanisms to make it as easy as possible. And, and, and so like I gave some examples that are really popular in first world countries, but the real benefit of this is in third world countries where they only have access to, let's say, feature phones where, where they can just send a text. And so what we're thinking there is that it's just a text message that says, you know, and they're answering, you know, on a, on either a numerical scale, so we don't have to worry about language barriers, uh, you know, how they're feeling today, and and building that in. And, and we know that this is not going to be the comprehensive data source that people are collecting now. But we, when you have scale, high volume of data that is that is consistent across the globe, it becomes very powerful from a modeling perspective when combined with other comprehensive data sources. And, and then you layer on the BSV protocol on top of that. And what happens is that the simplicity and the, the scalability of the protocol allow for this to be completely distributed and, and manage the, the, the volume of content that will be created at an extremely low cost. And um, is, this a, is this something you're actually working on or is it just a, an idea you're developing? No, this is this is a fully fleshed out idea, and that has a with, plan and and a, with a and, plan and to a, actually make it a practical proposition. Absolutely, yeah, and and we're hoping to we're hoping to launch this in the next thirty to sixty days. Oh wow! Yeah, if not sooner. Um, who is going to pay for this? Because there will be transaction fees, and we want to contribute to the ecosystem um, of of. COVID data because we think that it's beneficial. And so in in the beginning, we will cover the costs uh, of these transaction fees and, and you know, and, and we've carved out, you know, a budget for that. And then when it comes to a point where we've, we've run out of that budget, I think that along the way, we'll start to have conversations with the, the people that are using the data that, and you know, and and even even to the point where there are corporations that lever that can leverage this type of data for their for their understanding when they can open stores, and and if you think about it, you know, in in Toronto, Ontario, right now in Canada, um, they're they're reopening the our economy in stages, and and that's because based on the data that they have, which is all retroactive. I think the key is that all this data is retroactive from the point where someone tests positive, working backwards. Hmm. And so we're saying, well, nobody's looking at the forward-looking data. And how do we predict when there's going to be an increase in in people that test positive? And, and no one knows that yet. I mean, this will be great as long as a high proportion of people are using it, won't it? I mean... That, that's yeah. the you, you're going to need quite a bit of marketing push to get uh, the, the the level of usage up to a point where it's really going to be beneficial to an individual user, I suppose. Absolutely, 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 and I think and so we're we're working on some really neat partnerships with uh, global NGOs to to part to partner with them, and and I think that the the real opportunity that we're that the real thing that's going to help us along the way is the ability to for people to update their status across you know a thousand different platforms. So our challenge is to communicate the benefits to people that says take five seconds. You're waiting, you know, like you're, you're you have extra time because you're not commuting or you know you're on your walk and just take five seconds. You know, go into the same places that you already go and just a quick status update and that can help your entire community and protect your family because the more information you know about the areas around you the better it is for your family and you can make decisions based on relevant real-time data but when you say you could use twitter for instance to provide the information um so would that be like a certain hashtag and then you, yeah. and then you as a business would scrape twitter to find 
all the times that that had been used and would you be able to then find out where the person was when they tweeted exactly and so so all the places that we are going to be collecting the status updates have geolocation markers um you know not not to the not to the detail like we know someone's sitting in their living room mm -hmm. but you know the latin long is is available and all these all these different services and so for twitter example it, twitter is a great example and so you can use a hashtag if you want to share that information publicly or you could send us a direct message uh, to say to say this is my status right and mm -hmm. no one needs to know it um, for something like Facebook you know it's it's very similar where you can either post on a st you know on your wall or you can send a message uh, or on like on, on different services there, there's each of the different services have a public and a private mechanism to mm -hmm. communicate this information and we don't want to limit people doing that and and so what we do is we take we do two things one is uh, we take the information that they write. So if it's a written response saying, I'm feeling great today, we have natural language processing that interprets what people have written and translate, translate that into a risk level. And then, you know, alternatively, the example I gave for, for maybe in Nigeria, where they might not have full, you know, in, in rural Nigeria, they, they have just feature phones, you know, like just a flip phone that has numbers and, Right and the ha and and the hashtag they're not going to be publishing on Twitter, but mm -hmm. they know how to send. They can send text messages, and in that text message they can to a short code that says you know it's like one two three four five. They'll send you know feeling good or they'll say five out of ten or something along those lines, and and that will allow us to take that and 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 normalize it across all the other data sets. Hmm. Going back to what we were talking about before, which is the, the token issuing thing, how much is this sort of a variation on that? Because when we're talking about tokens initially and teachers yeah. and pupils and so on, I wasn't thinking in terms of that the recipient could somehow alter the token. But this is perhaps a token where you can write to it as well as just receive it. Is that the distinction? Right, exactly. And, and and the reason I brought it up is because within the tokenization sort of ecosystem, there's two major types of token, right? There there's there's security based tokens, which are which are, you know, have a un intrinsic value to them. And that, that that can be translated into money, right? Because it has um because there's a limited supply and there's and there's, you know, excess demand. And so so the price goes up. Um the the other side of it is just focusing on utility of the technology and that's where so that's what why i wanted to explain the two uh pieces it's really in, it's really important because people often only think about the monetary value of mm -hmm. a token but the because it's a technology there's a whole other side of it where the technology has value like a database right, right? Databases intr intrinsically have no value. They're just tables, right? It's what you put in them and how you write to them that creates value and utility for people. And, and so what we're saying is that this token has utility and the value of that utility is, is health data. So just going back to the, the sort of bigger picture here, Bayesian Group has all sorts of different uh, arms to it. Starting yes. really in the financial world mm -hmm. um just just for, for those like me who didn't know what bayesian was just just give us a, a sentence on that yeah it's because it's interesting it's you know uh, so so bayesian it comes from the term bayes theorem and bayes theorem is 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 essentially a formula that allows people to predict the probability of something and so, and so, the 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 key difference between Bayesian theorem versus the other forms of probability is that instead of coming to things with facts, you're coming with beliefs, and and and, and sometimes this construct of a belief is is sort of hard to grasp. But really, what we're saying is that when we start, when we have a hypothesis or a theory, we're not coming at it to say, I know this to be true and I'm going to prove it wrong. It's other way around is I think this is right 
and I'm going to prove it right. It sounds to me from a very superficial look at it that it takes into account the sort of human dimension rather than yeah. being a sort of pure, cold, mathematical theory. Absolutely, yeah. Words like belief, like that, that is a very human term, right? It's, a very, it's, it's humbling, you know, for in, in many regards, because you're, you're just saying, I believe this. And when, like in normal language, when you say, I believe something, people, are, people don't think you're coming at it from a factual basis. Right, but it's it obviously opinion. determines your behavior. Exactly, exactly. And I think the base theorem is, is that. And, and that's why it's the foundation of probability, because probability is saying the likelihood of X of something happening is, is X. So with this sort of theory uh, as an inspiration, what is Bayesian group doing with that? And what's the whole approach? Yeah, so the Bayesian group is is a collective of companies, you know, that that offer financial services. But, but at its core, there's there's two things that that Bayesian group sort of represents. One is we are we are a technology company. At at our heart, we are a technology company. We build really powerful technology. Um, right now, we build it for the financial services space on blockchain. And uh, the second thing is that we don't want to come at things from a place of certainty. We want to come to pl- we want to come at things from a place of uncertainty. And I think that's especially relevant in the crypto and the blockchain world, where the volatility is so high, where you know where where the industry is changing on a daily basis. And so so uh, other companies are coming at things saying. I know the price of Bitcoin is going to go to $150,000. That is not our approach at all. We're saying we don't know that. How can we determine whether that's going to happen or not? What is the likelihood of that? And and that lends itself to technology really well because you're trying to you're trying to build algorithms and you're trying to build strategies that that help support that. But you also have uh, uh, behavioral scientists and people on board as well, don't you? Yeah, we have behavioral scientists. We have we have uh, neuroeconomics professors that work on our team that are that are looking at the human side of economics. They're looking at the human side of finance, and and which really sort of supports that Bayesian model. The the other piece around Bayesian is is from a technology perspective, right? So so how do we build an inference engine? And an inference engine is essentially sort of a tool to support decision making by outputting prob- probabilities, and so you know, for for us, the the sort of the machine behind our belief system is this inference engine, and it supports all of our companies. It supports our market making service, our liquidity provision, our OTC desk, our hedge fund, and our research team. And and the way that it incorporates that is. It says, okay, let's pull in data from from different areas, sentiment data, you know, human human driven data. Let's pull in market data around the behaviors of people from a trading perspective, and then let's uh, pull in news sources and data around that, and then take all that information and apply that to trading algorithms and concepts that that we can evaluate, and then. Instead, uh, and then and then what we do is on top of that, for our hedge fund at least, we say we built the strategies that we that we know are are gonna we think are gonna work, and then and then what we do is we have a an AI powered hedge fund decision making system. So that so it sits on top of this inference engine, and instead of a person making decisions that can be emotional emotionally driven or market driven or or some other way we we go and we we allow the technology to make that decision and it, and then evaluate whether or not the technology made the right approach and made the right decision and then evaluate and re, re, readjust i shouldn't keep you much longer but i just wanted to end by asking you how your company sees bitcoin sv as uh, in relation to the other cryptocurrencies, because you do work with other currencies, but I think you have a particular role for, for BSV. 
Yeah, so because we're a technology company, we approached the decision of what to build on and what to use from a pure technology perspective. And so when you, when we evaluated each of the different technologies, we we looked at scalability. So so what is the what is the maximum block size because that has a big impact on 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 data collection and what we can do. We we looked at the cost per transaction, but we also looked at the future and the stability of the protocol and 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 bsv sort of met all those things you know other other protocols are great for different things for our specific purposes bsv for right now is the right protocol because it like like we wouldn't be able to do the covid token on on btc it would be too expensive and it would be and it, it would be really clunky and the other real thing for us that's important just like any other technology is stability right we don't want the protocol changing 50 times over the next two years because that brings a real risk that what we're building needs to be modified and change it's like when you choose a, a technology platform you kind of want to stick to it for a little while that's why programming languages like microsoft.net or c++ or these other languages or even like you know the even things like regular language like these things don't change you know drastically over the course of time just to understand when you're talking about trading uh, algorithms that are trading in other cryptocurrencies is bsv involved as a platform for those kind of transactions, or are you just talking about for the the, the apps like the the COVID app and stuff that you're using BSV? Both, both, both. We 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 do we we trade a lot in BSV, um, and but we also use the technology underneath the protocol that that helps it because because you know at its core all all these blockchain protocols are our technologies and so and so you know we we make sure that when you believe in a technology you're willing to trade that i think that we we believe that bsv is currently undervalued the same way that we believe btc is undervalued as well and a lot of the tokens we know that they're they're all increasing a lot of them are increasing in value at various levels i think that the um, for us we see that bsv being the most undervalued right now well, Eric, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been really fascinating and um, really good luck with your COVID app, which sounds sounds like an amazing idea. I hope you'll come back and tell us about it when we can all try using it. We would love that. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Eric. No worries. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Many thanks to Eric Bernhard of the Bayesian Group. And please join me, Charles Miller, again next week for another Point Geek conversation. Thanks for listening and goodbye.